Welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Five Years Later, Measuring the Outcomes of the Global Compact on Migration. The Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration is the first intergovernmental agreement by the UN which covers all dimensions of international migration in a holistic manner. It was endorsed by the UN General Assembly on December 19th, 2018. And it's been about five and a half years since that endorsement and since the implementation of the compact began. Today, we will look at where we are in the process of implementing the GCM and what progress has been made. And we have three experts to talk about where we are in the process and this progress who are with us today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Ellen Percy Crayley. She's the Professor of Geography and, Envi and Environmental Studies Emerita at Colgate University. She has been an advisor to governments and to the UN during the process of the GCM. And she's also the former editor of the International Migration Review for the Center for Migration Studies. Our second speaker will be Amy Mudin. Amy is the deputy head of the UN Migration Network. She also was the special assistant to Louise Arbor, who was the special representative for the Secretary General during the GCM process. And she's been with IOM since 2005. And lastly, Michelle Lavoie, who is the director of Platform for International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants. Michelle has been a voice for vulnerable migrants for over two decades before governments and international institutions. We welcome all of you today to the webinar, and I'd like to call on Ellen to begin her, her talk. Ellen. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's wonderful being with all of you and with particularly um, Amy and Michelle. What It's an honor to be on the screen with you. Um, Thank you for this invitation to participate in this critical moment of reflection on the life course, perhaps now the adolescence of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. In this regard, I commend and really admire the programs of public scholarship and communication embedded in the mission of the Center for Migration Studies. In my brief comments, I'll linger on the tools and processes for monitoring the progress of implementation, the theme of today's convening, begin with paragraph 70 of the International Migration Review Forum Statement of Progress, which proposes the development by member states of a limited set of indicators building on the global indicator framework of the sustainable development goals and the targets for the 2030 agenda, as well as other relevant frameworks. This development of indicators is, in my view, both a critical step first in acting on the general principles and objectives of the GCM, and as a mean to complement the Global Compact for Refugees, and second is a process to foster further uh, collaboration among member states, national statistical offices, and stakeholders throughout civil society in international migration governance and programs. During this past year, I've had the privilege of being an expressive and respectful, hopefully respectful, even affectionate bystander in the regional and general consultations regarding the, this development of indicators, which will very soon, I believe, are likely to be adopted. And perhaps Amy can speak to that point of process in a few minutes. I do think context is relevant. Placing the present within context is truly part of the job description of a college professor. I personally recall the quiet and committed work of Susan Elsner, who in the spring and summer of 2016, as head of the New York office of the UN Non-Governmental Liaison Service, worked to bring the voices of civil society to bear in formal consultations for the New York Declaration on Migration. Susan was committed to enlarging the table of participants, all of you, uh, in the consul consultative process and was a force for inclusion in those early days. These have been important moments and are recognized as such by our colleagues in the UN Network on Migration. Moments that hold precious potential to building an empirical foundation for effective public policy regarding migrants and migration in this 21st century. 
The set or framework of indicators has now been realized and includes approximately 20 core indicators and about 40, 41. The numbers shift a little bit. Uh, other relevant indicators for each of the 23 objectives of the GCM, one or two core indicators for each and a more variable range of other relevant indicators. Um, for example, to illustrate objective two, minimize the ab uh, adverse drivers and structural factors that compel people to leave their country of origin. The two core indicators include unemployment rate by age and sex and persons with disabilities, and whether or not the national migration strategy addresses migration linked to environmental degradation and the effects of climate change. And then the relevant uh, indicators include, let me give you just two, completion rate of primary and secondary education, and whether or not legal frameworks are in place to promote, enforce, and monitor equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex. And then there are eight more. Um, Objective 19, create conditions for migrants and diasporas to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries. So the core indicator is whether or not the for country formally engages members of diaspora and expatriate communities in agenda setting and implementation of development policy. And secondly, uh, whether there's an existence of a dedicated government entity or agency responsible for enacting immigration and diaspora policy, citizens abroad, for example. Um, there are also indicators that have been identified with the ten guiding principles. And from my perspective in this, uh, the work of the network, the extremely relevant uh, um, uh, benchmark is the guidance for analysis. What do we do with these data? What do we do with these indicators? In the form of recommended disaggregations, to hope and which will hold the potential to enhance the relevance of the core and the uh, additional indicators. This final system is the result of consultation and process of convening surveys, roundtables, and solicited feedback. And because of all of this input, the system has indeed changed over time. There are excellent summaries of these consultations and survey results prepared by the UN network, and I commend these resources to you. Um, the iterative evolution has made this system of indicators more relevant and fit for purpose, I love that phrase, um, in response to these inputs, to these interests. So we're what we're witnessing then are processes that are iterative, consultative, ideally inclusive. Let me offer what I consider five critical points in the evolution of this system, these changes. First, we see shifts in perspective and, um, uh, and emphases. For example, the regional consultations underscored the complexities and multidimensionality of human migration and population movements. For example, the critical role of conflict and environmental change, the significance of gender and youth and uh, age, and specifically the dynamics of youth in processes of migration. And these changes in perspective, the widening of the lens of the drivers and impacts of migration resonate in critical ways with the next generation of international migration scholars. As Kevin said, I'm currently working on a, uh, an anniversary um, uh, issue of the International Migration Review with two other wonderful colleagues. And um, the response from new and emerging uh, migration scholars with new ideas uh, from all over the world, these scholars are asking new questions. They're posing new methods in answering those questions. So the framework is in step with where migration scholarship is going, I believe, and could really deepen that those synergies. Second, consultations also recognize the general need for international as well as national indicators of progress aligned with international frameworks, frameworks that both Amy and, and Michelle have worked on. And, and I would add the expert groups on migration statistics and the expert group on refugee IDP and, inter and statelessness statistics are particularly relevant in this regard. Third, expressed throughout the consultation process is the value of inter and intranational collaboration. 
I would argue this very process of developing the indicators is highly consistent with objective 23 of the GCM to strengthen international cooperation and global partnerships. Fourth, the inclusion of 10 key background statistics, which is a new addition to the uh, set of indicators, is a specific, very specific change in the system. And to use an American movie reference, you had me at number and proportion of international migrations in the total resident population by age and sex, number of international migrations in the total population or area of origin by age and sex. I have fallen in love again, as always, with the importance of demography in the, in the analysis of international migration, displacement, and population flows. Um, uh, what, and and it's, it's been inspiring to me in that regard. My fifth and final point advocates for the return to objective 23 of the global compact to strengthen cooperation and partnerships and to think more strategically about collaboration in the pursuit of action and implementation of the objectives and, and the guiding principles. Could we begin to imagine leveraging cooperation and collaboration to reduce budgetary impact and increase capacity of member states and other stakeholders devoted to migration and sustainable development? For example, consider objective eight of the Global Compact to save lives and establish coordinated international efforts on missing migrants. Could core indicator two quote, whether or not the country has systems in place, including formal cooperative agreements with other countries to trace and identify missing migrants. Could that core indicator lead to sharing capacity and capital between and among countries? More generally, could creative approaches to international and intranational collaboration serve to balance costs, even burdens of the implementation of the global compact? Could international cooperation become the cornerstone in realizing the objectives of the global compact and acting on its principles? These are audacious questions offered with some irony, historical irony, because as you recall, the earliest expression of the global compact, the zero draft issued in February, 2018, emerged from consultative processes following the New York Declaration. The zero draft included 22 objectives, not 23. And it was the basis for negotiations held by the General Assembly between February and July 2018. During that process of negotiations and discussion and conversation, the 23rd objective was added. And it was determined to be relevant for the implementation of both the objectives, the global compact, and Yes, it's an audacious argument that cooperation and collaboration, sharing, exchange, relationships, can we use the word friendship in problem solving, will be routes by which safe, orderly, and regular migration is realized locally and globally. At the beginning of my remarks, I admitted to be a respect, admitted to being a, an expressive bystander to the advancement of the global compact. I do believe in its inherent rightness. And I believe in the courage and importance of the work that, the, uh, that those of you are involved in, in its pursuit, work that holds the potential to promote the security of migrants throughout the world, as well as the vitality of our communities, our landscapes, and our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin and the Center for Migration Studies for organizing this discussion. I was just looking at the list of the attendees and it's nice to see a number of familiar names uh, in there. I hope you're all, you're all doing well. For those of you who are not familiar, I'm with the Network Secretariat and the UN Network on Migration was created by the Secretary General in response to member states as they negotiated the Global Compact on Migration. And then the network itself was endorsed in the Global Compact itself. So consider how you have a whole of government approach and a whole of society approach as guiding principles in the global compact. We like to think of the network being as, as meant to be the whole of UN system approach to the GCM, providing not only its support to member states as their contacts and priorities change, but also providing, I hope, 
is a platform for a growing and dedicated global compact community, including yourselves. So we're at the halfway point now um, between the first and the second International Migration Review Forum of the Global Compact on Migration. In the course of this year and next year, we're already undergoing our second round of the regional reviews. We just had the, the, the first one for the European states in March. We have the next one coming up for the Arab states in the first week of July for Africa, continent-wide regional review, the second week of October. The Americas, hopefully later this year on Asia Pacific, early next year, preceding all of those regional reviews in the regions will be a number of multi-stakeholder consultations that you'll hear about that are set up to help both influence the agenda of the regional reviews and also outline ways of participation in the regional review itself. So taking a, a step back, when we look at the first International Migration Review Forum, I'm hoping you're all fully aware of the Progress Declaration, which was that outcome document. And most significant about that Progress dec Declaration itself is that it's the first time we have a consensus text as related to the Global Compact on Migration. You may recall in 2018, the Global Compact was not achieved by contentious, it was adopted in a very uh, politically contentious atmosphere. So we're already seeing uh, a political sea change, if you will. And if I look back at the start of my career in IOM in 2005, and I know many of you from, from that time as well, and you will also recall that in that time and around 20 years ago, member states were barely interested about talking about migration in the UN. So we're already starting to see this development of interest and agreement that migration needs to remain a top priority on, on the UN agenda. But in the Progress Declaration itself, we also see that the, it recognizes the positive contribution of migrants, <clears throat> excuse me, and it also contains some language that's a lot more uh, forward thinking than the Global Compact was. For example, on the obligation of states to protect, fulfill, and respect the human rights of migrants, regardless of their status, which is new, which, uh, which is stronger language than was in the Global Compact itself. We see stronger text in the Progress Declaration about eliminating racism and discrimination of all forms in the context of migration. We know language about climate change as an adverse driver of migration. A number of notes, lessons learned from the pandemic about the impact of travel restrictions on mobility, about the impact where migrants did or did not have access to services at that time or did not have any type of legal identity or adequate documentation. The persisting constraints we see about upholding procedural safeguards when it comes to returns and readmission. We've started to see more of an embrace by member states about regular pathways and the efforts to enhance the availability of them, the diversity of them, and also in due consideration, including as a way to prevent the smuggling of migrants, as well as the recognition of a number of regularization programs that took place during the pandemic and is now viewed as a good practice. And of course, the Progress Declaration also calls for greater national efforts for implementing the Global Compact. But lastly, the, the Progress Declaration also outlines two specific mandated activities to the UN Secretary General, which comes down to the network and its partners to help develop and implement. One is on developing actionable recommendations on strengthening cooperation on missing migrants and providing humanitarian assistance to migrants in distress. And the other one is what Ellen was just briefing us about on the proposed limited set of indicators to track GCM implementation. Now, both were requested by member states in the Progress Declaration for the UN system to provide to them. And they will be launched in the, in the coming weeks, and they'll also be included in the forthcoming Secretary General's report, which will be released later this year. But the ultimate tests of these proposals and recommendations is how member states will really assess them, how they will view them, and how they will use them. They were part of the consultation process already, but how they will use them going forward is yet to be decided if they decide to use them at all. Remember in the progress declaration, they make clear that these are proposals for them to consider. So they may or may not be included in the next progress declaration for, for action. But as they're launched in the course of this year and following the secretary general's report, we'll be reaching out to you for your support on this. <clears throat> 
But in the meantime, and excuse me for, for my cold and my cough, that's rather persistent. The network has rolled out an, a number of tools and policy briefs that I'll provide a link for. Um, some of it, let me go through it very quickly. As you know, the, the, the Global Compact calls for capacity building mechanism. And we, we have established that including through the development of six interagency multi-stakeholder facilitation teams that exist at both regional and global levels, where we've provided over 25 UN country teams with UN system-wide support. So those UN country teams can best support their governments, those governments in implementing the global compact. We also have a number of thematic policy tools, including on bilateral labor migration agreements, on regular pathways for admission and stay for migrants in situations of vulnerability, <clears throat> on ensuring safe and dignified return and sustainable reintegration. We have an advocacy tool on anti-discrimination on grounds related to race and gender specific to the con in the context of the pandemic. And we also have a policy brief on alternatives to detentions and what, what kind of good practices can governments and stakeholders do. Now there's many structures and processes and tools that are in place, but ultimately the implementation of the global compact really rests with member states. It is a member state developed framework for cooperation and it is up to them to follow up, review the process and also implement this, this framework. And we know the compact is only as good as, as its impact in terms of you know, are we improving the lives and well-being of the many millions of people uh, around the world who are the focus of the compact, migrants, their families, and all of our communities. And as I mentioned earlier, that since the global compact was adopted in a not so political positive environment, after its agreement, we started to see some things change. We're starting to see some governments develop national implementation plans. We saw Kenya launch one um, last year. Portugal released one in the very first year after the GCM implement uh, was a, after the GCM was agreed to. And we also have GCM champion countries, which are growing in number, also starting to undertake con consultations to develop national implementation plans. And also these GCM con GCM champion countries. They're growing in their number and their political willingness to make sure that the GCM is brought to other multilateral fora and help influencing those outcomes like we saw in last year's SDG summit and in the future summit of the future. We also saw in the last round of regional reviews and the last IMRF that over 90 member states provided voluntary reporting on the, prog on the process of their implementation. And I find that this is um, a, a really critical behavior when you consider that the Global Compact is a non-legally binding agreement, because what we've seen at the global level since then is a lot of behavior and action towards embracing the compact. We've seen governments who voted no or who uh, were lukewarm towards the Global Compact in 2018 have changed their national position and now embrace and support this. They participate in the follow-up and, and review process. Now, of course, implementing the Global Compact is not without challenges and difficulties. We know, and you know really well, that migrants continue to lose their lives. They continue to be exploited, to have their lives at risk. They face exacerbated vulnerabilities and inequalities. And we are still seeing a lot of anti-migrant sentiment growing, its impact in the public and in the political discourse and elections. And I, you know, we need to look at migration in the broader context of multilateralism itself and how that's working or not. We can't view migration on its own, but link it to how to other issues of cooperation. And we do have this global compact as that standard for international cooperation on migration, that cooperation that brings together the member states, UN entities, and stakeholders, migrants themselves to help bring the compact to life. <clears throat> I hope that we've been, that, that as the network, we're trying to create and build this GCM community and where we can engage you better. Please do let us know. We do want to improve this. And as we have another two years to go to the next IMRF and Progress Declaration, it would be great to hear from you about what do we want out of it and what do we want to see improved. I look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much, Kevin. 
Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, uh, for these excellent presentations uh, by Amy and Ellen to start us off and for a lot of reflections so far. What I wanted to do in my input is just to highlight some examples of how we see the translation of the Global Compact in a policy context uh, by highlighting some examples from Europe. Um, it was interesting to hear uh, when Amy was saying about how many countries have actually developed uh, national plans on how they'll implement the Global Compact. So our, this input that I would like to give is not actually based on a lot of those plans because we don't know how many um, exist. But it's really, well, I mean, you mentioned uh, Amy Portugal, but and maybe some others in Europe have some, but it's really just to show the links between the intention and the commitments in the Global Compact and how we see the ongoing policy development. So I'd like to start with a couple ones uh, that are in the more negative direction and then end with some that are more in the positive direction. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, the Pact on Migration um, that the European Parliament uh, and Council and basically the EU have adopted um, just this spring. A number of these legislative frameworks um, have just been finalized now in the adoption in April in the European Parliament. What we see what will happen now that we have the pact, and I should also mention that the EU pact was proposed by the European Commission in September 2020, so two years after the adoption of the Global Compact on Migration, which the Global Compact was adopted by two thirds of EU member states. So in terms of what the EU pact now will entail going forward is that any person coming to Europe who does not have a valid travel document will likely be detained in border facilities. There's no exceptions concerning the age, so families with children, including babies, will increasingly be detained. Um, people who will not be considered eligible for asylum will immediately be directly uh, channeled into deportation procedures, disregarding other possible avenues for regular pathways. So, for example, a number of EU member states have medical permits or family reunification, but this kind of um, focus on either asylum or return um, means that they won't actually be considered for those other ones. Um, people won't have any effective legal representation while they're going uh, undergoing administrative procedures at the borders. Uh, people who are appealing their deportation order can be deported while waiting for a decision on their case. And we will most likely see an increase of people who are racialized, um, whether they are people arriving irregularly at the borders and the outside EU borders who are already undocumented in the EU or EU citizens due to increased and new screening procedures. Um, and we also will most likely see a derogation from key safeguards uh, when uh, member states claim that a third country is pushing people to their borders, which the EU pact calls instrumentalization of migration. So we see a, a direct challenge to the commitments in Objective 13, um, where member states pledge to immediately work to end detention of children uh, and to work towards alternatives to detention. Objective 21 on return, Objective 17 on eliminating discrimination, and Objective 7 on vulnerabilities. We also have a development recently where 15 EU member states ministers of the interior sent a joint letter to the European Commission asking the Commission to deport undocumented migrants before they even reach EU borders. Uh, we in, in this line, we have the Italy-Albania deal or the UK-Rwanda deal. Um, this is sometimes called externalization of migration. And that uh, challenges objective 21 on safe and dignified return. Um, and yeah, it's a, maybe a different understanding of objective 23 on strengthening international cooperation uh, more in a negative way. We also have uh, increased criminalization of solidarity. So it's interesting on this particular objective because um, this uh, entails people who are providing humanitarian assistance to migrants, but who are penalized for doing it. And if you look in the Global Compact, you can find this in Objective 8, which talks about search and rescue of migrants and ensuring that the provision of assistance for an exclusively humanitarian nature is not considered unlawful. 
But it's interesting because it doesn't really appear in objective nine on anti-smuggling. And this maybe is a hope for the indicators uh, framework that Ellen was referring to, that maybe in that framework, there could be a mention of the anti-smuggling legislation, which is being used to criminalize uh, people who are providing humanitarian assistance to undocumented. Um, ECOM did a media monitoring in 2023, and we found that there were 117 people who were criminalized for providing humanitarian assistance. Of those 117, 46 were concerning search and rescue of migrants at sea, but all the rest were for other reasons. So, for example, people who provided shelter to migrants or local authorities who provided um, inclusive policies at the local level or people who provided migrants with food, water, and clothes. So there's kind of a, a challenge with even the, the framework of the Global Compact that, that focus on not penalizing humanitarian assistance is really only an objective aid where it should be also looking at anti-smuggling legislation. And another kind of negative um, development concerns at the member state level, so the national level, uh, some developments concerning access to services or access to healthcare, and this is Objective 15. Um, what's interesting in Objective 15 is that there's wording that says um, that service providers and immigration authorities should um, not exasperate any vulnerabilities by compromising safe access um, to services or infringing upon the human rights to privacy, liberty, and security of, pe of person at service delivery. So basically upholding the right to privacy and protecting migrants' personal data or, or establishing a sort of firewall so that personal data is not transmitted to immigration authorities is not only an objective 15, but it's an objective 3, 4, 8, 11, 14, and 21 of the Global Compact. But we have at least three member states of the EU that are either continuing existing policies where they require um, immigration, where they require health services to report to immigration authorities like Germany, or they are proposing legislation. So Sweden is now looking at potential legislation that would require service providers to report as well as Finland. Um, last week in Sweden, there was a hearing at the Swedish parliament and a wide, wide range of service providers, local authorities, basically professionals from so many walks of society, so many different areas, were saying that such a law, if it goes through, will not only um, obviously have huge consequences for individuals themselves who are undocumented, their health needs, other needs, but also, in general, it will in, endanger a basic trust in society and people's trust of authorities, as well as professionals' uh, ability to do their jobs um, and even fighting crime and safety. So we see a, a lot of potential negative developments, but I want to end on some positive ones. So um, one of the ones I want to mention on the EU level is uh, concerning undocumented children. And this concerns objective 15, concerning access to services. But then it's also interesting that there's 27 mentions of children in the Global Compact. And here I want to refer to council conclusions of the EU on the child guarantee from June 2021. Um, the EU council decided then that there were um, children who needed to be uplifted from poverty by the year 2030. And amongst the children in the EU who are particularly vulnerable to living in poverty, undocumented children were specifically mentioned. And so member states should then try to provide free early education, ed uh, childhood and care, uh, free education, healthy meals at school, free health care, healthy nutrition, adequate housing. So. The challenge now is the member states have to develop national action plans on how they will do that. But what's useful and very interesting is that the Council of the EU prioritized undocumented children. And so the, the wording in the framework is there. Another framework at the EU level that was also recently adopted, well, this one this year, uh, is the EU Single Permit Directive which addresses objective five on regular pathways and objective six on fair and ethical recruitment and decent work. 
So just uh, in April, um, the council approved new work permit rules for migrant workers that would improve application processes, uh, labor mo market mobility, and possibilities to escape uh, exploitation. We also have at the EU level, the recently approved uh, Violence Against Women Directive, which addresses objective 7C on vulnerabilities and gender responsive policies. Um, here it's kind of a caveat. So the one concrete step forward on this new EU legislation on violence against women is that um, the text of the final version requires EU member states to make shelters available to all win women who experience domestic abuse, regardless of their resident status. It does not specifically say there should be a firewall. It just says these shelters should be available. So there's definitely still room to improve, but it's a starting point. We also see on this um, um, safe reporting that at the national level, Spain allows it for undocumented women. The Netherlands has it for victims of crime. The EU itself has the Victims of Crime Directive, which it's currently revising and where there's also an opportunity to strengthen this. Um, and the two last points uh, I wanted to mention concern regularization. So many of us know that if you do a search in the Global Compact, the word does not exist. Um, but if you do a search for changing status, you'll find it in Objective 3D on providing information to people about how they can change status, and Objective 7H and 7I concerning vulnerabilities, where it also talks about changing status. So the concept, in a sense, is remaining. And we have in the past years, and Amy mentioned some of these as well, countries that have regularized both during COVID and afterwards. Um, so Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Greece are some of the ones we've seen in this region. We also have a handbook that an EU funded project called Mirum is developing on regularization. That's a multi-stakeholder initiative and is foreseen for next year. And finally, the last very brief point I wanted to mention concerns objective 4E on proof of identity and legal documents. Um, Portugal amended some laws in 2022 and 2023, which includes some provisions of regularization of children born in Portugal to undocumented parents. So I'd like to end here. Um, it would be great if going forward, I only had positive things to talk about and not negative. Thank you. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the record of the United States on the Global Compact on Migration five and a half years since its adoption. As you may recall, the United States was not involved in the negotiations of the Global Compact because at the time the administration in power was not interested in the issue or opposed migration. Fortunately, the new administration in 2019, I mean, I'm sorry, in 2021, endorsed the compact and agreed to try to implement its provisions. Uh, so we're gonna judge the US on what they've done since that time in 2021 when the new administration took over. And I would say that the record is, is mixed, although there have been some very positive things that the US administration has done in compliance with the GCM or consistent with the GCM. And I'll start with the positive first and then talk a little bit about some of the negative. First of all, they've used a tool uh, which is consistent with objective five for creating safe legal pathways for migrants. They've used a tool called humanitarian parole very liberally. It allows the president or the executive to bring in individuals or groups depending on unusual circumstances uh, and depending on you, the situation that they may be in. The administration, the U.S. administration has used this in several occasions to bring in about 76,000 Afghans after the end of the Afghan war um, in 2021, in August of 2021. They have brought in about 180,000 Ukrainians under the United for Ukraine program because of the war in Ukraine. And they've created a program called the Cuban, Haitian, Venezuelan, Nicaraguan, I'm sorry, Nicaraguan, Venezuelan program, 
CHNV, which allows 30,000 of those nationals from, each, from those four countries total into the country each month. At current, currently, they have brought in close to 500,000 nationals from those countries in, our, in this hemisphere, which is a large number over the last year and a half. So this is a very positive step, a way to bring people into the country legally, and they don't have to take a dangerous journey to our borders. The administration also created a program, a family reunification program, in which families who do have petitions to get a green card here in the United States, permanent residency, can join their loved ones in the country while they await their visa. And these backlogs can be quite a long time. So this is a very important family reunification component that they've added. They've also done some things to correct the bad acts of the last administration, including reuniting children that have been separated and also lowering the standard for what's called public charge in which family sponsors have to show that um, a person, a family member they're bringing in will not be a public charge and are not dependent on governmental programs. Another new initiative under Objective 5 is the creation of safe mobility offices in certain countries in Central America. Under these offices, uh, migrants can come and see if they can qualify for legal entry into the United States. And these have helped, this has helped uh, deter people from coming um, irregularly through Mexico in a dangerous journey. The SMOs have referred as many as 18,000 refugees to the U.S. refugee program, uh, and 9,000 have already arrived legally. So this is a new initiative which will only grow in the years ahead. In terms of Objective 7, which talks about <laughs> irregular status and transitioning migrants to regular status, the administration has also done a couple of good things. First of all, they've used what's called temporary protected status very liberally. That, that's a statute that allows the president to provide legal status and work authorization to undocumented populations because there are countries from which they hail are in such a condition that they can't be sent back because of conflict, climate change, or other conditions in that country. TPS has used, been used by the administration for 16 countries to date and have affected 700,000 people who are allowed to work and remain in the U.S. and, importantly, can send remittances back to their home countries. So this is very important. They've also increased the approval of permanent residency applications, which slowed down in the previous administration. Just last year, they reached 1.2 million, which is um, a record over the last 10 years. So that's very important as well. Moving to objective 11, which talks about borders and managing borders in a humane way, there's both good and bad. Uh, first of all, they ended immediately when they came into power, the administration ended the migration protection protocols, also called, called Remain in Mexico program, which denied asylum seekers entry into the U.S. And they had to wait along the Mexican border for their asylum hearing, which can, lay, which can uh, take several years, actually. So it was a, effect, effectively denying them access um, and encouraging them basically to give up. That was removed. Also, although there was a delay, they did in Title 42, which was a Trump era uh, regulation that prevented any migrant from coming in because of COVID. And on May 11th, 2023 is when they ended that. However, on the same day, and now we're turning to the bad, they introduced a regulation called the Circumvention, Circumvention of Legal Pathways Rule, which denied asylum seekers entry into the U.S. and the chance for asylum if they had not availed themselves of asylum in a transit country, such as Mexico or Central American country, which they came through. This uh, disregards the fact that those asylum systems are very weak and there's no real process for them to acclaim asylum. 
in those countries. So that was on the negative side. And most recently, you may have heard, the Biden administration issued a presidential proclamation which denies asylum for those who enter between ports of entry um, at a, depended on certain metrics. If 2,500 or more asylum seekers cross illegally, in their words, um, through, between ports of entry, then the president can effectively shut down and deny anyone coming between ports of entry asylum. It also raises, uh, complicates the process for those who do enter in ports of entry as the burden is on them to want to claim asylum. In other words, they have to pass what's called a shop test. If they're going to be deported, they have to let people know that they're in fear of being returned. And this will have a chilling effect as well. These are two areas where the administration has not been consistent with the general the global compact on migration. And unfortunately, we hear there might be more rules coming before this November election. Those are some of the highlights of what the US has done and not done and gone against the GCM over the last three years or so. Um, so I give them a, overall a positive grade, but it's not certainly a perfect one. But we do welcome the US back into the uh, fold in terms of implementing the GCM and hopefully influencing other countries uh, to also uh, comply with the principles of the GCM. So now we'll turn to questions and uh, thank you for your patience and thank you for listening to our presentations. Yes, I think uh, there are huge challenges with the, the rights to seek asylum, but also the rights to seek other types of protection. Um, and I think we will see that not only in terms of these agreements, but also with the, all these new um, implementation of the PACT uh, legislation. Um, so I think in the PACT legislation is also uh, very challenging because it's on EU territory. Um, and so there's uh, the rules, obviously, of the EU member states uh, in the EU, which bind them in addition to the international framework uh, when it's uh, happening outside. So I, I think when I was looking at the, the different uh, objectives, and it was interesting, I think, Ellen, you were saying that about how the last objective even evolved, Objective 23. And I think, in a sense, it's almost a perverse understanding of international cooperation. Um, it's our reading, I think, uh, where we see it quite negatively, but I don't know if that's a shared view, to be honest, because of the proliferation of these agreements. Um, and so it's also interesting uh, um, when you look at some of the reports on how member states or the EU is uh, reporting on the implementation of the Global Compact, uh, when I think it was two years ago, the or no, for the um, 2022 uh, IMRF, uh, the EU itself, and Amy, please correct me if I'm wrong, submitted a report, but it was mainly how the EU uh, sees it externally. So not how the EU sees the implementation of the Global Compact internally. So I think all of these questions come into play, but um, definitely huge challenges and the role of um, lawyers and civil society organizations will be especially um, in increasingly important going forward because of this. Michelle, if, can I jump in? I think your point goes to the point that Mariana Ferrola raised in her question about the voluntary, the unevenness in terms of the um, uh, interventions, the voluntary reports during this last cycle. Um, I witnessed that in relationship to Asia and Pacific uh, round of 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 the the voluntary review process and. It also goes to an issue that um, another member of the aud audience raised. Um, uh, I want to get the name right. Um, uh, um, oh, a, a, an anonymous uh, question about uh, about the indicators and the limited set of indicators. I think what all of this reveals is issues of capacity and the unevenness, the uneven landscape of capacities in um, in government agencies. I see it certainly in statistical offices where stati national statistical offices are being 
um, invited, uh, pleaded to provide data for um, uh, uh, both for the migration network as well as other entities across the UN system. And so to think about ways that we can build capacity and and uh, foster the sharing of information that provides some consistency or at least some uh, increases the substance of reporting um, that uh, Mariana is kind of curious about. So um, I think your your response kind of speaks to several of the questions that have been raised by the audience. Kevin, colleagues, I might Amy, uh, chime uh, in as well, uh, just looking at some of the questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, also just following up on uh, um, we were just talking about Objective 23 and international cooperation. It wasn't there originally. Uh, you're, you're right about that, Ellen. And it was a reminder from those countries of the global south to the global north that it, it is actually a two way street and not only about returns, but about how their nationals are, are treated abroad. So it was definitely viewed in that context. Also, in the early draft of the Global Compact, you didn't have any reference to a capacity building mechanism. And that came from a lot of the countries of the global south to say this type of international cooperation is going to require this type of uh, capacity support for them to help to help implement this. Um, someone asked a good question or, or there, like the first uh, couple of questions about, you know, how do you measure success or how are you how do you address the gap between the standard or the ideal and what's happening uh, on the ground. No, I mean, the, the global compact, you know, I, I, I hear so many people say this over and over, and a lot of member states do say this is a non-legally binding agreement. At the same time, their actions do show that they do lend some political significance to it in the way that they report and the way that they show up and par participate in the follow-up and review process. But I think what's missing is there's, there's a huge gap from what they agree to. And sometimes it's just a different ministry agreeing to at the global level to what's actually happening nationally and regionally and even locally. You know, how much of in your own communities do your neighbors, your colleagues, your friends, your family know about the global compact on migration? But they probably know about the Paris Climate Change Agreement really well, right? You know, how do we make the global compact have that type of narrative in our discourse at our dinner table, the way that people can talk so easily about climate change and international agreements around it and international behaviors around it. How do we bring the global compact on migration there to explain what it is and, and what it and in and also what it isn't? I mean, <clears throat> Kevin really laid out very well what the US government is doing that's positive and not so positive. But I think the other part of that is also like, well, how are those communities actually viewing this too? And how is this now influencing the political discourse in that country and the potential election this year? I mean, the, these are, you know, the, these are things that we need to address and explain. Um, uh, in terms of um, reporting, absolutely, for the next IMRF next year, we'll release another type of framework where member states can provide, remember they're voluntary reports. There's no, there, there's no demand for them to actually provide a report every year. So we're providing a framework and where they do come forward with it, it is actually helpful for us to see what they're reporting on, but also what they're not reporting on and what's missing and to, 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 bring, to bring that back. Um, and then I think finally this on, why is it a proposed set of limited indicators? Because in the progress declaration, member states just wanted to have an idea of what the UN system could provide to them. Again, these indicators, they're going to decide whether or not they'll use them or not. It's its simply a proposal at this point. So I think you know, the reason why it went through such a long, open, transparent uh, process, including with member states, is to that when it gets launched this year, it already has significant buy-in about Here's the starting point for what we could do. We could take this forward if we can go beyond these limitations. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, can every can folks hear me? Yes. Sorry. Um, oh, great, great. Um, we had a, a question from a Jason Leggett. Uh, 
uh, what theoretical or scholarly from your work, how do you measure success? Um, and uh, maybe Ellen, you might want to take a shot at that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I love that question from from Jason. I think Amy has done a really good job in in actually addressing that that question by um, uh, in your comparison, Amy. It's really great when you said, you know, we talk about, you know, the 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 Paris Accord and and climate change, but no one's sitting around their dinner table or breakfast talking about the global compact, and that puts that puts into relief to me that, you know, social scientific social scientific uh, analysis theory scholarship has yet to really been able to kind of convert. Uh, conceptualization uh, in, into uh, into the policy arena as much as we would like to. That's why Center for Migration Studies is so important. MPI is so important. So many of the, uh, the folks throughout the global South who are really demanding that their social science kind of be brought to the table, I think is so terribly important. I mean, a few years ago, um, Bela Hove and I, Bela in the in the population division at the United Nations, really dug down to look at all the uh, documentation, all the voices that came into uh, the preparatory stage for the global compact. There was, and we got a paper out of it, and there was, uh, it, 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 in terms of ex doing the analysis of what stakeholders, particularly in civil society, were asking for in terms of models of displacement, models, theories, of the relationship between development and and migration, and there is there's such richness there, but we tend not to bring it up uh, uh, into a, a broader international uh, arena that would do what Amy would do. So we're we're really talking about issues of migration and development and sustainable communities uh, a little more generally. There's a, there's a lot of work to be done. Jason, you should do it. <laughs> kind of tease out of the global compact. What what is the migration theory? What is the development theories that are embedded in the in the compact, or what should be? Um, but we really do need to bring, we need to continue this march toward uniting um, uh, social science with, with policy and hence policy interventions. So we, we don't linger on the negative uh, tendencies that Michelle has um, laid on the table. So in such a compelling, such a compelling well, as well as the positive uh, dimensions, uh, tendencies that are un unfolding as well. So that's a terrific question and reveals how much work there is yet to be done by all of us. <laughs>